Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Uh, welcome uh, this evening to the Andrew Breitbart Freedom Center here at the Heartland Institute. Uh, my name is Jim Lakeley. I'm the Director of Communications at Heartland, and uh, we are a 32-year-old think tank. Until about nine months ago, it was headquartered in uh, downtown Chicago, and last summer we moved out here to this wonderful new building uh, that we renovated here in Arlington Heights in the northwest suburbs. And our mission since our founding has been to discover, develop, and promote free market solutions to social and economic problems, to fight for policies that shrink the scope and power of the government, that increase individual liberty, and encourage prosperity through vibrant free markets. Uh, Heartland covers key aspects of domestic policy here in the United States through our centers, the Center on Budgets and Taxes, the Center for School Transformation, a center we call Consumers for Healthcare Choices, our Center on Climate and Environmental Policy, and our newest center, the Center on Constitutional Reform. Now, uh, Heartland is very effective in our mission. All you have to do is ask our opponents in the arena of ideas or Google us, but don't believe about 97% of what they tell you, which is a number I'd like to use, but you are certainly known uh, by your enemies, and uh, we're very effective in that mission. If you like what you see tonight, whether here in person or watching the live stream here online, I encourage you to check out heartland.org, check out our blog, Somewhat Reasonable, our daily podcasts at, on iTunes, uh, check out our YouTube page where this uh, presentation is going to be instantly archived and easily, easily shareable with your friends. I think that the more you learn about Heartland, the more you like. Um, and I'd also like to uh, invite you to talk to a Heartland staffer here tonight about how you can browse books in our new library, the Michael Perry Mazur Memorial Library, which we dedicated in a ceremony here just last week. It is, without a doubt, the best collection of books on free markets and liberty that you will find anywhere in the Midwest. And uh, it grows each and every day uh, through the work that we have here with our library, growing library staff, part and full time here at Heartland. And if you have books on liberty and free markets that, you would, uh, that are in your uh, library, in your bedroom, in your basement, in your attic. Um, talk to us. We would love to add them to this library because it's in this library where those books will be read and used by researchers and students and faculty all around uh, Arlington Heights and the uh, suburbs of Chicago. And hopefully we'll be people coming in, policy advisors from Heartland will be flying in from all over the country to look over those, uh, those books and to use them for uh, new research that they will be doing. So please talk to someone here about donating your books. Um, or you can go to heartland.org and click on the library link uh, on the front page to also learn about how you can donate uh, books here to Heartland. Uh, also, summer is right around the corner, so uh, if you have relatives who are college-aged and would like to get experience working uh, in an organization that fights for liberty and free markets every day, uh, we have plenty of space here and lots of departments and lots of interesting things that a young man or young woman can do to advance liberty. So please talk to us about our internship programs, and there's brochures on the table over there that you can also take with you to learn more about it. And if these things are important to you, if fighting for liberty and uh, preserving free markets, true free markets, is important to you, I hope that you will consider supporting the Heartland Institute. And if you already support Heartland, I hope you might consider supporting us with just a little bit more uh, money, frankly, uh, because um, we all are in this together, and it's to save the country, frankly. To not, put, not to be too dramatic about it, but free markets and liberty are under attack every single day. And the people in this organization from in this building and the staffers we have all across the country work very hard and fight every day to preserve that liberty. So that brings us to our event tonight. What if, uh, what if we think everything we know about ecology and environmental policy is wrong? What if environmental laws actually make things worse? What if the very idea of nature has been hijacked by politics? I think those are very good questions. And we're going to get some pretty good answers tonight from our guest. Ryan Yonk is a research fellow at the Independent Institute, assistant research professor of economics and finance at Utah State University, and executive director of Strata Policy in Logan, Utah, whose mission it is uh, to, quote, help people make informed decisions about issues that impact the freedom to live their lives. He received his PhD in political science from Georgia State University and was a formerly an assistant professor of political science at Utah State University. Ryan's articles have appeared in such scholarly journals as Policy Choice, 
the Independent Review, and Political Perspectives. And he is the author or co-author of several books, including Green versus Green, Conflicts and Environmental Priorities, Political Ecology, and the book he's here to talk about tonight, which he wrote with Randy Simmons and Kenneth Sim, called Nature Unbound, Bureaucracy versus the Environment. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ryan Young. So they claim that this was on, but uh, there's a rule of thumb that I have. Anytime I get anywhere near a piece of technology, we will have a disaster occur. So just wait for that. It'll be coming. So the introduction, I think, was pretty appropriate as we talk about the book. So he asked a set of questions. And I'm not here with terribly comforting answers because environmental policy is rife with a tremendous number of problems, misunderstandings, whether they're willful or accidental. Um, we're going to steer away from that discussion tonight and mostly focus on trying to understand why environmental policy has ended up where it is. So let's start with the first slide, which is the actual cover of the book, Nature Unbound. They're available at the back table for sale. Uh, same, uh, shameless self-promotion moment, you should buy a copy. Uh, it's a great book, if I do say so myself. Um, but we started with this weird question. Because one of the things that uh, my co-authors and I, particularly Randy Simmons and I, uh, have been doing for at least a decade together, and Randy much before that, was trying to understand why we have this weird disconnect in environmental policy that we have to a lesser extent in a bunch of other policy areas, and that is a near complete hijacking of the policy agenda by the most radical forces that are interested in the question. Uh, and so we started to try to trace back what was happening throughout that entire um, policy agenda. And we ended up right at the very beginning of uh, naturalism in the United States uh, as a place where we started our, st our story. We're going to come back to that at the very end of tonight's presentation um, while we start to trace it. But we're going to end there. So one of the things that's been apparent to everyone, including Aldo Leopold, so if anyone knows that name, this is not somebody who is known as the bastion of free market policy solutions to the world. But everyone, including all Le Leopold, who worked for the Forest Service and is referred to as the godfather of the modern environmental movement by many, um, observed that, the more that more restrictive laws in the conservation area did not, in fact, lead to better outcomes necessarily. That they had, as he said, largely failed uh, in their mission. Uh, now, of course, he looked at that and said, the answer is more and more intense, but, he, but the re his observation was correct, that they have failed and they've continued to fail since his time. And so as Leopold was looking at this, he suggests an alternative that is more regulation, despite the failures that went on. And in fact, what we've seen is restrictive legislation has seen a resurgence. So if you trace environmental policy, you, you start out with, with complete wild west. There is very little. Then you see a spike with things like migratory bird management and those sorts of things. And then it sort of lulls again. And then around the 19, late 60s, early 70s, you see a massive spike again in environmental legislation from the regulatory approach. And that's not by accident. It happens for a reason. Um, because there are other things going on in the, ec in the ecological sciences that are gaining prominence over that period that are going to impact policy pretty dramatically. So that, I promise you, is as technical as we'll get tonight. Because that is sort of what we're going to trace is the rise of a concept that becomes incredibly important to environmental policy and hugely problematic. And that's this notion of a balance of nature. So, And put pretty simply, a balance of nature is the idea that somehow Nature should exist in an equilibrium. Again, I still am an economist, so I have to use that word, or close to an economist. If in, if, and if you removed human beings from the equation, that equilibrium would be perfect going forward. That somehow the problem in all of this is us. And then you couple that with an assumption that not only should nature be in this equilibrium, this state of perfection, but that the political process is perfect enough that you can make decisions that will minimize the impact of human beings to get us back to the balance 
that we've somehow disrupted. Now, I don't know about you, but it's an interesting sort of perspective to look at and say, so these are a couple, a young couple hiking in the wilderness, and my guess is they're probably closer to the modern environmental movement than they are to me in their vision of what the world should look like. Um, I pulled this off of an environmental website, actually. But it turns out that the claims are that they're the problem, that the environment, absent them, absent them and the rest of us like them, would return to some near Eden-like state if only we were gone. Now, there's a problem with this, right? It's sort of glaringly obvious that uh, human beings have been around uh, either from the very beginning, if you ascribe to a, a particular sort of Judeo-Christian view of the world, or from very early on, uh, in terms of emerging at least 10,000 years ago, that they've been impacting it if you, if you take a different approach to the world. But humans have been involved across that entire period regardless. Now, it turns out everybody except the environmental policy folks gave up on this notion of equilibrium in about the late 1970s. It had its moment. And then ecologists, doing what scientists do, continued to explore and to study. And they looked at it and said, turns out there is no balance. In fact, nature is inherently imbalanced. And what you're going to see happen is continual changes going on. And so modern ecologies have arrived at this. But somehow public policy never got past it. Public policy still stuck on this notion that if we could just get back to this primeval Eden where human beings are not involved, all would be well. Now, of course it's faulty because human beings are part of nature just like any other part of the ecological system. We have an impact. We've been engaged with it from the beginning. And in fact, the world left alone, left to nature to be wild, looks far more like this where you've got vines trying to outcompete trees, trying to outcompete ferns, trying to outcompete out grasses, and a continual change happening, where some of those plants, if they're left alone for a thousand years, won't exist at the end of that thousand years, than this, which tends to be the perception that environmental groups sort of put out there is what could happen. Now, this is very clearly a well-tended garden, a garden that is designed and where human beings have had a large impact. And this doesn't happen without someone tending the garden. Now, there's a great book called Rambunctious Garden, written by actually a New York Times reporter, shockingly a little bit, that traces this reality that the garden is rambunctious. It's, it's continually changing and it's continually fighting. And it's not necessarily this calm place where you arrive at a balance that everyone is happy. And instead, the world tends to look much more like this than like this. Now, the second part of all this that becomes particularly problematic for public policy, especially when you think about things like the Wilderness Act. Everybody heard of the Wilderness Act? Okay, it's this notion that somehow we're going to preserve areas that have been untrammelled by man, where man is a visitor but does not remain. Well, turns out there are almost none of those places if you look at the archaeological record and if you take a view of the last 10,000 years, at least here on the American continent, that includes Native Americans because they've been actively engaging with their environment over that period. So they did lots of burning. They were farming pretty actively. They were uh, changing their environment in order to make it more hospitable, to guide it and direct it. And so if you read the stories of the early American uh, colonists' arrival on the east coast of the U.S., they talk about the canopy being open and the ability to drive a wagon through the trees. That doesn't happen naturally, because naturally, it's more like this. It happens because there was continual burning going on by Native American tribes in that area because they would get a better outcome by engaging with their environment. Now, all of this should fly in the face of this notion that there's some magic state that if human beings just went away, we could get back to. But policymaking never got updated. 
and it never got updated for a, a large number of reasons. Um, so there's those two notions. It, it, never, it never got updated in large part because of politics and because of the politics that got entrenched into the bureaucracy. So all of, sort of all of modern environmental regulation starts to come about in the 1970s. You've got the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Wilderness Act. We could list them all. We run through them in the book in some detail. And they all, in their origin legislation, and then in the rules that emerge from it, are premised on this notion that somehow the water or the air or the land has departed from what it should be, what it would be absent human beings impact, and that the goal of the regulation is to move us back to that balance in some way. Now, if it's never been that way, and our goal is to try to take it back to something that's never been, how likely are we to be successful at our, what I'm going to call a fairy tale goal? not terribly successful. And in fact, that's what we've seen. Because it turns out, over the course of the 20th century, almost all the markers of water and air and land use were getting better at even before these regulations came into place because people were getting wealthier. And as people get wealthier, they start to have more time in order to think about these alternatives. They can begin to demand a cleaner, more pristine environment. And it was happening all without this notion of regulation, but almost all those improvements came not by man wandering away, but by being actively engaged in the process. So let's talk about a couple of interesting things. So 1969, there's an oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. I, I have no memory of this. I, I, am well, I come into the, this world well after that happens. But 1969, this oil spill, is a trigger point in the fight over environmental policy and legislation. And in fact, you can trace back the wave of legislation that happened, both the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and a number of others, to the public interest that gets drummed up surrounding the Santa Barbara oil spill. Now, in terms of oil spills are never good. They're not pleasant. I don't think anyone would argue they're a good thing. But this one was relatively minor in sort of the schema of, of oil spills. So let's, for those of that are going to clip this and have me say things that oil spills aren't bad. No, oil spills are bad. <laughs> but this one wasn't the biggest. It wasn't the most intense. But it was the one that was made for TV. This is the era where you started to have television coverage and you got pictures like the one here, washing a duck afterwards, that Wrote, that started to raise the public's awareness, and the narrative was set by those who were most interested in it, and of course that was environmental groups. And so they take what happens in Santa Barbara, California, tragic that it is, and use that to argue that we have a serious problem going on in environmental questions. Now, at the same time this is happening, around the same area, you have a second major one, major incidents happened for TV, which is the river on fire. We've all heard of this, right? Turns out the river, when it catches on fire, was the cleanest it probably had been in 30 or 40 years. Again, not good for those of you that are going to clip this. But again, it's made for TV. It starts to raise that awareness. And it's this notion that somehow all the environmental problems would just be solved if human beings weren't engaged in the process. And so you end up with policies that are based on this notion of separating and pulling people out of the environment and saying, if only we could get rid of those pesky people, everything would be good. Now, one of the most sort of tragic examples of this is in the Western United States, and that's with the bark and beetles. So um, around the area where I grew up in Logan, uh, there's a large number, of, there's forested areas, um, and one of the policies was that, got, that was put in place by the Forest Service and the land management agencies was we were not going to engage with the beetle infestation that was happening. And the beetle infestation, they burrow underneath the bark and they, and they damage and destroy the trees. But because we don't want to have human intervention into this, we're just going to let it run, they pull back and don't do anything with it. Now, what happens if you don't do anything with the beetles? Well, that's a pretty good-looking forest if you have a beetle infestation there on the the far side, 
and you end up with large scale dying off of the trees, which then increases the fire risk, which we've not been allowing fires to run in the West because, again, human beings should not intervene. And so you end up with large scale wildfire problems. And you can start to see the logic of how these things begin to run. When I was a kid, in, in 1989, I remember driving through Yellowstone Park during the fire. We were coming across the top of the park, and the fire is jumping over the road. We're right there in the middle of it all. It's this weird memory that you have when, you, when you're young. And I didn't really understand it then, but it was the same sort of result that we ignored and we, keep, we kept from doing any fire management, any sort of allowing fires to burn in the park. The policy was, got to put out all the fires, and then we can't do anything about them. So we have this flip-flopping notion of what the right policy outcome is. And everything builds up so that by 1989, it's a tinderbox. And the park burns. And the Forest Service doesn't put out the fire. Why? Because they're now firmly into this period where you do not intervene in these things. Probably was the right policy 60 years earlier, if they'd let them burn, but not such a great policy if you've let things develop, things grow up over that period. Again, this notion that, there's, that we get wedded to in policy of separating and pulling people out and just pulling them out solves the policy problem leads to these sort of perverse and odd outcomes. So all of that leads to this weird, this interesting question for me. And this is where sort of my policy academic geeky side will come out. Because every time I hear this discussion of preserving nature, um, I run around with a large number of folks that are, are very green. They, dinner parties are wild with these, with these folks once they start to know what I do. And I, want, I always want to ask them this question. So what is it you're trying to preserve? And the answer is almost always, what it was. Well, what it was when? And what it was for real, or what it was in, your ima in the, imagine the collective imagination of Americans that was set up large part as the rise of the national parks happened. We've got to figure out what it is we're going to want to preserve. If the policy goal is to preserve something, we got to at least know what it is we're attempting to preserve. And instead of answering that harder question, we instead substitute in, well, if we just get rid of human beings out of the process, that's what we're preserving is the world absent humanity. Again, never was and never will be that you can actually achieve this. Because nature changes, and in fact, nature degrades. Nature doesn't just get better, particularly for some species. Sometimes the end of the road is the end of the road and you go extinct because you can't adapt. That's the reality of nature's flux. And humanity is part of that flux and has been as long as human beings have been on the earth. So in, in Yellowstone National Park, if you go there today, you'll see herds of bison and herds of elk. If you look at the archaeological records, um, sort of what digging has been done in the park, you see almost no bison or elk bones in the digs that have been done. Why? Well, it's not because bison and elk can't live in the park. We know they can. It's because if you wandered into that area, there were a number of Native American tribes that lived there, and you were dinner. And so they weren't living in the park. In fact, if you read Trapper's journals, they talk about how they're living, they're in Yellowstone Park, the area of Yellowstone camping, and they're hungry and they're starving. And so what do they do? They don't just go kill a bison that wanders by. They send someone out to the plains to get a bison a couple of days ride and bring it back because they're not there. And again, it's not because they can't live there. It's because they've been interacting with human beings to the point where they would run. It's also why there, are, uh, there were white-tailed deer found and not mule deer. White-tailed deer run when somebody comes after them. Mule deer turn and look at you. And what happens if you turn and look at someone that has an arrow, a bow and arrow, or a gun? You're, de you're done. It's over for you. But again, this is the sort of interaction that happens, and human beings are part of that and have been for a very long time. Well, I promised we were going to come back to John Muir.
This is sort of the patron saying, if Aldo Leopold's the godfather, this is the patron saying of modern conservation. And John Muir had a deep love for the Yosemite Valley. There's, in fact, I, I quite enjoy reading the poetry that is his work. It's, it's beautiful prose. Turns out the ideas are terrible in general. But John Muir saw the Yosemite Valley and he had a preference. He had something he wanted. Just like all of us, we have preferences. So did John Muir. And John Muir looked at it and said, I want to preserve what he called the cathedrals of the mountain. Wanted to keep them the way they, he saw them. Now, turns out the way he saw them was as a result of a lot of intervention from various, various groups, but he wanted to preserve it. And so he had this idea. And if you've been watching PBS and The Greatest Idea, you can learn all about how Yosemite comes to be. But he goes and he's trying to figure out how to preserve it. And he's failing pretty well to get to drum up support. And then he hits upon an idea. And his idea is, ba is the basic idea that modern environmental policy has followed, is he invites this guy out, right? He decides that rather than fighting it out at the local level and in sort of the arguments that are made, he decides that if he can just get Pre Teddy Roosevelt to come see the Yosemite Valley, Roosevelt will be so impressed by the beauty that he will step in and he will preserve it. He's right, it's exactly what happens. Uh, Roosevelt gets there, Muir takes him through the Yosemite Valley, shows him all the greatest things, and Roosevelt's convinced. But Muir doesn't actually make any progress until he changes it from a discussion about what is local and what those questions are of what's going on ecologically and turns it into a political discussion. And essentially, that's where modern environmental policy has gotten today. So why do we keep the balance of nature as the foundation for all these laws? Not because it's good science. Ecologists have moved past that long ago. We keep it because it's good politics. It's politically advantageous for those that have a particular outcome they want to tie these things to a theory that says, if we can eliminate the influence of human beings, then everything will get better. And if you're going to eliminate the influence, guess what that means? Human beings can't do anything on those lands or in those waters. And so we get things like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, that then have the perverse outcomes that we talked about in some detail. So, what should future policy do? Well, I don't have a lot of concrete suggestions other than not use the balance of nature as the sort of scientific bedrock of our policies. But it's focus, if you want to talk, have a rational discussion about environmental policy, you should actually focus on results and not intentions. Because most of environmental policy, if you read the Clean Air Act authorization, you read the Clean Water, you read the Wilderness Act, it's the intentions that get put into law and that everybody focuses on rather than re the results. The Endangered Species Act is particularly problematic in this regard. Um, recovery of species, very little could be attributed to um, the Endangered Species Act. We, we're in the middle of a big project right now where we're doing a statistical analysis of recovery. And it turns out getting a, getting a private group that has money interested far exceeds the listing in the probability of recovery. Because most species that are no longer listed didn't recover. They get delisted because they're extinct. The second is a recognition that nature is and will forever be in flux. And trying to capture any moment of that is a fool's errand whether it's climate change policy or endangered species, a notion that the moment that we've identified as being our preference is the right moment, Hayek would call it the pretense of knowledge, a, a fool's errand. And the third is to recognize that human beings are actually a part of nature and they matter in that and they have from the beginning. So, there are some principles that emerge that we should be consistent of, and this is sort of what happens, that nature, natural wilderness preservation and ecosystems are all human constructs, not necessarily scientific ones. They're how we have decided to describe what we see in the world. And that managing nature from a strict, if you want to protect biological diversity in particular, 
does better than natural regulation because the natural system is brutal. If you can't compete, you die. And the political principles are, and these are probably far more important, that powerful political force are invested in the current legislation and regulation because they have a particular view of what they want the world to be and that making political change requires extensive and intensive political entrepreneurship. And then this is the one that's never any fun to acknowledge. It's much more fun to get up and talk about how we're going to change the whole system. But marginal change are far more likely to occur than wholesale ones. So that's where I will end. But I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. All right. If you have questions, please sure. uh, raise your hand, and we'll go. We'll start right here with Larry. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, one small point, and sure. then, the, then the question. Uh, as you point out about uh, nature changing itself yeah. all by itself, uh, we know that at the time of the Roman Empire, uh, Egypt, the Sahara Desert, fed the world. Yeah. It doesn't anymore. What a coincidence. Um, the, so the question I have, though, is uh, talking about uh, what you are uh, mm -hmm. talking about, isn't the entrenched bureaucracy really uh, inexorable here? They're there. They're looking for more things to do. For example, the Clean Water Act uh, that I was peripherally involved in sure. way, way back was really concerned with point source yeah. solution. Yeah. If you had a, a mercury going into a stream, right. this was a bad thing, and you could clean it up. Yeah. Then they went into non-point, yeah. then to redefining what a wetland yeah. is. So if you got all these bureaucrats and thousands of lawyers, they have to do something. Yeah. Is that the real problem? So, so that is a tremendous part of the problem. So um, now part of what's, I think, most interesting about that, because I think you correctly identify one of the chief problems of actually making change here, and that is who selects to work in agencies like the EPA? People that have a strong commitment to the mission of the EPA. It's one of the things I tell my students over and over again. It's great if you want to go work in the think tank world. That's wonderful. But if you really want to be part of attempting to change policy, go work in the EPA and be vilified for decades. And until there's enough folks with a different perspective working in the agencies, change is unlikely. Um, what's particularly interesting is we're at a moment now where the agencies are changing at a rate um, that could be moderately problematic, depending on what you look at, is you have a large number of, of appointees that came in during the Reagan administration that are now retired. And so we're likely to see a change again in what the agencies are are oriented towards, and I think an acceleration of regulation is likely given who is selecting into the career paths that lead into places like the EPA or Department of Interior. Again, I, I said I didn't have good news. A reminder, please identify yourself so our speaker knows to whom he's speaking. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Jim. Uh, yeah, this is David Perenboom. Um, <clears throat> could you tell me a little about the Utah State, where you come from? Because in my thrust of my my interest and question there is that it uh, seems to me that so much of modern academia in the United States and other places is so hostile to what you are trying to research that it must be, you must be a unique island out there or something. Oh, oh, <laughs> Thank you. you. Um, yes. <laughs> um, the, the one thing I will say, and this is, uh, because all too often, I, even I will express my frustration about about the academy. We have a, a pair of economists that we, we spar with in another department. And one of the things, once we decided we were going to actively engage them in a real discussion and not engage in any more name calling is what I'll go with, um, we found that we've actually made some progress. They don't agree with us. They still think uh, that we're um, crazy is what they think of us now. They used to think we were totally evil. Um, and so there is at least a chance that if we're going, that the only strategy for folks that are interested in these questions uh, in the academy is, is engagement. The more we retrench and hide in little pockets, uh, the less likely we are to actually influence the discussion that's going on. And so uh, one of the things that, uh, I work with a large number of students. We have about 80 students that are undergraduate research assistants that we work with on a variety of projects. Um, and we very specifically don't just hire them from economics um, or disciplines that might be viewed as primarily free market oriented in the beginning. 
we're interested in helping them, and then they help us understand how to talk to folks that aren't natively um, free market minded in the beginning, so that we get strong pushback on our ideas. Because what we don't ever want is to be in a sounding chamber where we're not engaging the real critiques. And if you miss engaging the real critiques, then you get tagged with all of the ideological critiques as well. And so we push pretty hard to expand out. In fact, one of our policy analysts um, at Utah State, um, the College of Natural Resources, uh, it's not a secret, is a place that's pretty heavily focused on regulatory approaches to dealing with natural resources. Um, we hired the, um, their, um, their best student, the one they graduated at the top of his class over in that college, um, in part because we were interested in hearing his perspective and having him do pushback um, in, in our work. And so what we found was that over time as we worked through the questions and we had to address particular things that we thought were so basic that we had to actually go in and demonstrate and prove that we found we were, we were learning a way to actually make some progress with students like him. Um, he's mostly come around. Um, but it wasn't easy, and it wasn't, um, and it wasn't because he just woke up one morning and decided it was the research process walking through that. Um, so in higher ed, um, it's not a lot of fun when your colleagues denounce you, um, but it's also um, the data take us where the data take us, um, and what we're doing is research, and so we can't anymore walk away from our research results then we can make them up. The, the results are what we found. And so regardless of what the attacks are, um, if you're going to be a person of principle, you have to stand behind what it is you find. Uh, and we don't always find the results we expect. And it's as important to release those results as it is any other. This is, uh, I'm Art Ellingson, Arlington Heights Tea Party. Yeah. I'm aware that NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, is part of the Department of Commerce. Yeah. But what about the EPA? Is it its own entity, or does it report through a cabinet officer? If so, which? EPA is a special independent hybrid in the federal government that was, it was supposed to be taken out of the political process in order to um, be more scientifically sound. Uh, what that's in practice meant is that the EPA administrator um, is not a cabinet level appointee, but um, essentially directly reports into the administration. Um, and it, it didn't solve any of the political pressure concerns that uh, it was set up to do. So it's not, it's, it no, doesn't it, report the, to a cabinet the, officer. The person that uh, is in charge is the, is the EPA administrator. Uh, in some really roundabout ways, yes. Uh, it's a little bit of a complex map as you go up. So who is his boss? That's uh, ultimately the, the, the president is the right answer for okay. who the boss is. OK, thank yeah. you. Hi, Bob Angelica. I was out in Yellowstone in the 1990s several yeah. times. And it was a great deal of concern about how the elk were degrading the park. Yeah. And there were all kinds of theories as, well, let's let Native Americans hunt in the park. Maybe the wolves will yeah. handle the issue. There was this attempt to mi kind of micromanage the situation. Yeah. What's the situation in Yellowstone now? How would you rate it? Not great. Um, so this is, it's, it's an interesting, I think, reality that's happened. So there was this notion in the 90s that, that you lay out that what had happened in Yellowstone is you'd, you'd eliminated the apex predator. Then if you could get the apex predator back, you would control all these things through a process called natural regulation, which essentially is tied pretty heavily to this, the ideas of balance of nature. Uh, and what we've seen is there has been an impact when you reintroduce wolves, um, but it's clear it hasn't had the sort of trophic cascading effects that they predicted. Uh, and you continue to see the northern range in particular of Yellowstone uh, in relatively degraded uh, conditions based on if you sort of use range management uh, techniques to ask that question. Uh, and you continue to see uh, the elk are down, but the bison numbers are, are up, and they're expanding out into communities around Yellowstone. And so it's, it's, an, it's a continuing problem for Yellowstone because instead of trying to, instead of actually engaging with this idea that there's a management approach, it's stops and starts and running back to sort of these old notions of, well, we got to just get hands off and everything will take care of itself. 
but it's then it's hands off and put the wolves in and then be hands off and then it's hands off and do this and so it's it, it's a continual readjustment in Yellowstone and it's the way the park has evolved over the last 30 years or so it, um, is they, they haven't made the progress they claimed they would okay again raise your hand if you have a, another question I'm gonna read one from uh, our people watching online oh, great. in the chat room this is from uh, Grace Conyers hello Grace and she asked, um, she asked early on in your discussion, actually, yeah. about uh, what the role of lobbyists is in all of this. And I think you touched on that a little bit. So when you, ask, ask, when you answer that question, I actually would like to expand on a little bit. And it seems that the EPA is becoming increasingly radical. And when you think it cannot get any more radical, it gets even more radical. And you see there used to be this concern about a revolving door among activist groups or lobbyists from uh, government agencies and back and forth. And so that is basically the definition of everybody in the EPA. They're all former um, radical environmental activists and they get put into positions of high authority in the EPA. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit about you know, the lobbying influence on this, but also the influence of these radical environmental groups that in any other agency or any other aspect of what government regulates would be outlandish, that they would not be allowed to be in there, yet it is the reality for today's EPA. Well, so the, the first response is I, I wish it were as outlandish as you as you sort of present there. It's um, a far more common reality across regulatory agencies than you might than you than we would want to acknowledge. Uh, that having been said, um, you see a tremendous number of again these are folks that are self-selecting in. They have a preference, and they're scanning the horizon to say how can I achieve the preference or my worldview. And one of the ways is to go from uh, lobbying, which uh, I would classify many of the major environmental groups as being at least in part lobbying organizations to move from that into government, into the regulatory ro uh, realm, and then often they'll, they'll go out again. And this happens in uh, the DOD has, this, has these things that come up time after time. So do the other regulatory bodies. Uh, the, consumer pro the Consumer Safety Commission is going to be seeing that increasingly. Uh, and so it's a, it is a tremendous issue. Um, but again, it's not an issue. I, I wish I could say it was environmental uh, policy alone that faced this, but it's, um, it's ubiquitous across the sections. What we tend to see is um, it's more, a little more transparent because the folks are moving from large groups that have an active communication strategy, whereas if you're moving into the DOD, the last thing the government contractors sort of groups want to, they're not out there standing on the street corner shouting for what they want. They're using a different strategy, and so that tends to be less transparent. Hey, uh, Ryan, this is David Pernboom again. Um, <clears throat> in your previous talk about El uh, Yellowstone yeah. up there, you used the term degraded, yeah. especially on the northern tier. Could you elaborate on sure. that? Sure. So, uh, the, so the reason why I slip into this is we, we have actually a large project. We're working with some wildlife ecologists and range scientists. Uh, on the northern range, which is, so you've got Yellowstone, and Yellowstone has at least three separate sort of biome areas, areas of the park that are distinct. Uh, you've got forested, you've got the area around the geysers, and then you have the northern range, which is by Gardner, Montana, by and large. If you've ever been in through Mammoth Hot Springs, you'll notice that part of the park looks very different than when you go up and you get into the, the timber line. And so on the northern range, this is where a lot of the elk have wintered and the bison have, has started to winter. And so range scientists have ways of measuring health of the range, what sort of local species are there, what's the growth like. What are I, I spent three days with a range scientist, and all I heard about was blue bunch grass for three days. Um, if I never heard or saw another thing of blue bunch grass, I'd be okay. But it's, it's one of the markers of range health, and that's the sort of stuff they're looking at. Um, and it's ended up, it, the northern range looks as though it's a very heavily uh, utilized. So for example, if you had cattle grazing on the northern range and the range outcomes look like they do today, you would likely see a permit reduction if you were a permittee with the government because of the quality of the range, because there's been damage done from a range science perspective. It's a very, it's a technical answer to a, to a question, but um, it's always where you retreat when you when you're not the expert on range science. I know we can I can talk about what it is I do know, and that's blue bunch grass. And apparently, the the more that gets degraded, the more you know the range is bad. I have another question. Then. Sure. <laughs> can you was there a tipping point when environmental regulation went 
over the edge. I mean, you know, I remember as a kid in the 70s, you know, the picture of the, the Indian with the tear coming down and the garbage everywhere, and who's not going to get behind that, you know? So you know, clean, but when did it become, when did it morph from cleaning up the environment and preserving, you know, the ecological structure of the country to this radical agenda? And it's like every government agency, they never stop moving forward, because that's progress, see? So, but where was the tipping point where you saw it starting to get out of control? I, so I, I don't think there was a tipping point. I think you've had multiple agendas in the regulatory structure from the beginning. Um, if you read the early uh, parts of the National Park Service and their Organic Act, you see a clear distinction between uh, sort of those that would agree with Gifford Pinchot, who's a conservationist, and those that are in sort of the Muir camp. Um, and you've seen an ebb and flow of which camp is sort of dominant in regulatory policy. But in, in the 60s, when you started to have what I called made-for-TV environmental crises, um, that seems to be the moment when the public then had an appetite for a regulatory approach that was far more intense. And so rather than it being a, a, a switch necessarily in the government agencies, I think it's actually a switch in how these things were talked about in the general public which then had an appetite for a different form of regulation. Is there, a, is there a particular president or EPA administrator or government bureaucrat well, that, that you would call maybe the worst one? Uh, you, you, you know, are worst just one? not going to let me s tiptoe around. Uh, no, I'm not. I, I'd, I'd like to know. I want names. I uh, want who, who's the one who really pushed it over. So, I mean, if you look at when these things came into being, you see this is the early 1970s. Um, Richard Nixon was, uh, was part of a great number of these sort of things. Um, but again, it's, it's more than any one individual. The rise of the sort of the Sierra Club and those groups uh, certainly has an imp had an impact. Um, if you want a study of how to organize uh, and actually drive change, read the history of the Sierra Club and then the groups that are surrounding it. Um, they, I mean, political science hat on for a second. They, they managed to completely change the narrative about this policy in the public's mind, and then we're able to drive the policy change uh, through the bureaucratic agencies and, and the legislature to a large extent. So that's sort of the, that's the, um, that's the best answer you're going to convince me to give. Because I don't think it was any one president or any one person where the tipping point was. All right, you're off the hook. Um, Bob Angelica again. Yeah. The latest figure I saw in the press was that deferred maintenance in the national park system amounts to $12 billion. Yeah, at least. Uh, what do you see as the real change that we need in the National Park Service to make it a, a so, viable so organization? Sort of two things as you deal with that in particular. Um, the first is um, part of the reason why the deferred maintenance costs are so high are the prob is the problem of actually being able to do the maintenance in the park. Um, the NEPA process alone for uh, taking actions inside a national park is 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 pretty onerous and that raises the cost quite a bit. Uh, and then coupled with um, a recognition that if we're, if we're going to choose to continue to invest in national parks, there is an infrastructure cost that comes with them. And again, this ties back to this notion of balance of nature where we shouldn't be active in these parks. They should just be set aside and everything will be wonderful. And so that changes the priority. You don't want to build a road or you don't want to fix a road if your notion is that we've set this aside to be preserved as opposed to be as opposed to be used for recreation. And this actually is the National Park Service's Organic Act tells the National Park Service to do both of those things at the same time. And not surprisingly, when you give two contradictory missions, it doesn't go so well in, in terms of the outcome. Uh, in part, it's a question of, okay, what are we going, what are we going to do in the national parks? Um, and it's clear uh, dealing with those budgetary and deferred maintenance and changing the incentives so that the park superintendents and the park service doesn't have an incentive to let it get worse and worse um, because there's lots of good evidence that the bet is if it gets bad enough in my park then I know Congress will step in and allocate funds to fix this and so we see a lot of that sort of behavior going on inside the bureaucracy which is perfectly rational given the incentives the bureaucrats face but if you're going to prevent that behavior, you've got to change the rules of the game they're playing in. Um, Diane and I recently spent a few hours walking through a county park in Wisconsin, Calumet County Park, and the amount of dead trees and dead wood was just shocking. Uh, it was like 
it looked like a forest fire had yeah. gone through or something. So all of this dead wood was just waiting for, for a spark. Yeah. And it was just ruined the whole experience. So it was a good example. It's not just uh, Yellowstone yeah. that we're talking about. It's even county parks in Wisconsin and here in the Midwest yeah. where, where this attitude exists. Um, Scott Walker, when he was a candidate for president, endorsed a proposal by the Heartland Institute mm -hmm. to replace EPA with what he called a committee of the 50 chairs of the state EPAs, committee of the whole, mm -hmm. he called it. Um, he said EPA was created with noble intentions, got a lot of stuff done. We are now chasing the last molecule of pollutants. Yeah. The federal job is pretty much finished. The states have now built up their own capabilities and records mm -hmm. and personnel. So let's devolve responsibility back down to the states. Let's block grant EPA back down yeah. to the state level. Donald Trump also endorsed that plan. Um, Has he, he opposed it yet? <laughs> <laughs> and once elected, he will just <laughs> declare that it is the law of the land, maybe. Uh, but is there a chance? Could we see, you know, with entitlement crises and big debts and things on the horizon, with the public getting frustrated with business as usual, with perhaps Tea Party type Republicans in the House and the Senate pushing for real reform, could we see a dramatic reform that might rein in EPA? If anything's possible. Um, so uh, here's, so I, I think it's an interesting idea. And I, I tend to be in favor of devolution of most things um, from the federal government to the state level and then um, eliminating the role of government in a whole bunch of things entirely because you don't just want to replace the federal government with, with 50 doing that same thing. One of the issues, and this is, again, goes back to who selects to work in these agencies. Even at the state level, you see the same sort of selection. So let me give you an example from Utah. So Utah, nobody would describe Utah as a liberal state. It, it, it's just not. But when you look at the agencies, especially the environmental agencies in the state, they have a, they have a perspective that is much closer to the national EPA's view on things than, uh, than you would expect given um, the political climate in Utah. Now, it tends not to be true of the political appointees at the very top, but once you get down into the agency, then you start to see these things. And that's, I think, one of the lessons uh, that should be learned about federal bureaucracies is political appointees are well and good, but if you're going to drive real change, it's in the career service bureaucrats that you see um, the ongoing policy continuity. And so could it happen? Maybe. Um, I hope it would be better, but given the structural realities, I'm not certain uh, that it would necessarily be better, but I would be willing to bet that it would be um, because I, I prefer devolution over um, unitary control systems. Uh, we have another question here from online. Again, it's uh, Grace Conyers. Uh, she says, can you comment a, a bit on the role of the media? What do you think they can do better, and can science communicators help? So, so two things. Um, can the media do better? Of course. Um, but the media is um, not this mysterious thing. I mean, the media is, um, at its basis, its goal is to, is to drive people to its content. Um, and so... That's the one thing to keep in mind, is that that's what, what is going on at, at its base level. Um, and part of the response has been, especially for those that, are on, that have opinions that are not, um, that don't comport with what the mainstream um, sort of thinking on an issue is, has been to retreat from engagement with the media. Because uh, you don't tend to get treated super well. Uh, you get your, your quotes might get mangled. But that's the strategy that leads to more isolation and a continuing sounding box in the media. So more engagement's important. An engagement with a plan. An engagement where you're talking about the real issues and not just sort of shouting in the wind about how terrible it is. Because if you want a terrible quote to show up in, in, the ma in mainstream media, to use that term, Rail about how awful the mainstream media is or how, it's not, well, how they cover something isn't fair. That's a recipe for a quote to be, pretty, to be a terrible quote. But engagement uh, is important. And so to the second question, that it's, mo it's more actively communicating the message and not retreating into either the insular nature of the groups that we, we enjoy talking to or 
uh, simply communicating things that are just sort of numbers and diagrams. Um, there are, there's lots of good work being done by academics, um, but all, all too often they stand up and they talk about their, their econometric model, and that's the last thing they say about it, and they think, ah, I have now communicated uh, what I found, but it turns out in higher ed, there are four people that work on the same thing you do, and all four of you now understand what you said, but nobody else does. Um, I go to macroeconomic panels at, at academic conferences, and I sit there and go, I got nothing. I don't know what you're talking about. Help me understand what it is you found. I can follow you once I understand what you did, but until then, it's no more clear to me than it is to anyone else. Identify yourself, please. Uh, Ken Braun, um, Congress uh, never would have voted to let Yellowstone burn. Um, we just had some regulations passed by a government agency yeah. against, uh, you know, rules imposed on e-cigarettes without a vote of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, these are these aren't rules. These are what our Constitution properly defines as laws, but mm -hmm. they're being being passed without yeah. any 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 constitutional authority being granted to yeah. them. My question is uh, actually goes to the academic friends of yeah. yours. Uh, is there ever do you ever run across social social uh, or public policy professors, law professors? Does anybody discuss the possibility that our regulatory state is just assuming unto itself powers that it doesn't have constitutionally or shouldn't have? So with, with one tweak in the way they talk about it, yeah, there actually is an active discussion of this, but it tends to be focused on. Congress's uh, self-interest in re-election and they're pulling back from the regulatory world uh, and the oversight role that they very clearly should have in both the agencies and the policy making process. Um, and so there's lots of active work being done on why, why is Congress pulling back? Because they do less oversight in meaningful ways. Um, they're, they're less engaged. You see more, uh, more rulemaking through the agencies with no congressional Input. And in fact, Congress has actively, instead of engaging the policy process, written legislation uh, in many of these areas that just authorizes the agency to do something. Um, and then the agencies, being self-interested people that they are, I mean, again, we can't escape this notion of self-interest, um, they, wa they want to do what the mission of their agency is, and so they actively go out underneath that. And it's, it is a, it is a a wide discussion with varying degrees of concern about it. Most of the, the research in political science in particular has focused on trying to understand why Congress has moved into this approach to policy making. Now, to give a little commentary on it, I think it's actually hugely problematic for the way policy gets done. Because what happens is we, we morph into a notion that somehow the experts are gonna be the ones to make the policy decisions. And that's not the framework um, that was envisioned by the founders, and it's not the framework that actually works uh, to govern uh, a nation like the United States. Engagement by the politic was always the intent and the importance through their representatives, and when even the representatives step back from the policy process, it's a problem, and it's something that we should be deeply concerned about. One of my favorite things when I go to Washington, D.C., is to harangue the members of Congress from Utah about why they're not more engaged in the policy process. Um, and part of the reason is it's risky, because as soon as they take a stand, then they have to think about the electoral consequences. But last I checked, that's what they signed up for. That's basically what I tell them when, they, when that's what their staff tells me. Phil Wick Klein. Um, back in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, there was a fellow in the state of Missouri who owned timberlands amounting to about a third by, by geographic area to that which was represented by the Mark Twain National mm -hmm. Forest. Now, the Mark Twain National Forest employed somewhere around 200 individuals in their, oh, maybe half a dozen outlying mm -hmm. uh, forest service uh, uh, facilities and the main office in Rolla, Missouri. Mm -hmm. So there were 200 people to take care of a uh, geographic area of forest about twice what 
Leo Dry's mm -hmm. land involved. Yeah. Both facilities use people from the outside to actually cull the timber, yeah. clear the timber and so forth through timber sales. 200 for <laughs> the Mark Twain National Forest, Leo Dry had two yeah. foresters yeah. doing the same thing on an area about the third of that size. Uh, it, it tends, and I worked with the EPA for well over 20 years, there's a lot of people that are there for the security mm -hmm. and to maintain that population. And it has little to do with almost anything. Yeah, no, I think what, I mean, what you're describing there is a perfect example of bureaucratic self-interest. That how, so in the, in, as a bureaucrat, how do you, ha, how do you have status and power? Well, it's have more direct reports and a larger budget. And you see that sort of stuff rampant in, in government systems. And in fact, it even bleeds over into private businesses that have bureaucratic setups. That that's, if that's how you have status, um, that's where you will naturally push for, so you'll push for increases in both budget and size. And who are those? That, who are the folks that want those jobs? The folks that are interested in the mission of what's going on in the agency. Um, and so you end up with this ongoing increase in size. Um, that's that you can end up with 200 and on one set of land and two on the other. Um, my I don't my my bet is that neither was the perfect number because we don't usually know what those are. I'm pretty certain 200 wasn't right either. So. Joe, Joe Tregesser, am I correct? Does the federal government own like 50% of the land in the nation? And like some states like Nevada are 70 and 80%? Yeah. That's first question. Second yeah. question is um, what is the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management? Is that a federal agency? Mm -hmm. And thirdly, What's the basis for the federal government to own all this property? I thought they could only own like post offices. So that there, there is so much there. So let me take the two easy ones first, and that is, uh, the BLM is in the Department of Interior, um, and its mandate exists under uh, in the modern era FLIPMA, which is the Federal Lands um, Management Act, essentially, where they are. To, to manage lands that are not forest lands and are not other lands. Um, so imagine things like, if, you cut, if you've ever been to Utah, um, look for sagebrush, that's BLM land typically. Um, and that's, they've been, their mandate is to manage those lands. Um, now, the tougher question, um, and, and then yes, they do own a tremendous amount of lots of the western states, that if you move, if you draw a line down the country, basically the Mississippi River, you see really high levels of private land ownership east of there and very high levels of public ownership by the federal government west of there. Um, there's been an active sort of discussion about this in the west over the last three or four years with pushes from Utah's own legislature included um, to push back against that federal ownership, in large part based on the question you asked, which is under what authority do they own them? Well, the federal, the federal land, the, the FLIPMA, uh, basically is, is the act that's used to manage the lands that are continuing to be held by the federal government in the West. That's where they draw their authority from. Uh, there's lots of good constitutional questions there. Um, Utah's involved in a lawsuit um, or is going to be involved in a lawsuit, uh, depending on where, where they're at in it, uh, asking those exact questions, which is under what authority does the land continue to be held? Um, I'm not optimistic they can win that lawsuit given the current makeup of the court. Um, it got a lot tougher when Justice Scalia died. And so they're continuing to push forward on exactly those questions because the argument is the Constitution is pretty clear about what the federal government has the ability to own. Um, so why have they continued to hold title to lands in the West? And the push from folks like um, the person to read on this, if you're interested in sort of the state's perspective, is Representative Ken Ivory, um, who's worked with a number of groups on this. He lays out a case um, of how he views it in particular. Um, 
I agree with like 90% of what Ken says in that regard, but uh, never can agree with everything. But it's real and important questions that ought to be explored. And too often those discussions have been shut down with notions of, well, this is settled. Of course the federal government can own land. Well, constitutionally there are bigger questions that ought to at least get explored in that regard. Time for a couple more questions, and so if you have one, please raise your hand. Here's another one from online. Um, education policies are beginning to include environmental classes that are aligned with current EPA policies. Is there a way to balance the lessons that our children are being taught, and they mean within the education system, mm -hmm. not by pulling them home and homeschooling? Yeah. Well, so this is, a, this is a great question. Part of the issue there is where does, where does curriculum come from? There's been too much of a disengagement from that process um, and it's been, an, it's been a gap. It's one of the things that, um, that I'm most interested in because I think there is, in fact, would be some demand for uh, conservation-focused um, training in this regard. But there's been an active push by those who have, again, a different set of opinions and preferences to push in modules that teachers can pick up and use um, to teach things like the science curriculum. Now, that's, there's an issue there, right? I mean. If we're concerned about bias in the school curriculum, uh, we should be concerned about whatever side the bias comes from. But if there's not an alternative available, if there's not a, a product that a teacher can pick up, um, then it, 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 it just can't get picked up and we don't even know precisely what the landscape will look like because there's a dearth of these sort of, um, a, these sort of modules, if you will, to be able to teach these things. And there's been an active push to create them by those who have a more sort of environmental, environmentalist focus. And they've been, they've been, there's been a push since at least the 1970s. I remember as a kid, um, the Earth Rangers um, or Earth Justice League or whatever it was um, that we would watch in, in elementary school. All right, no more questions? Okay, the book is Nature Unbound and our speaker tonight is Ryan Yonk. Let's give him a, a hand. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone watching online. Thank you for being here. Drive home safely. Bye-bye.